so let's go ahead and get started. Again, today's topic, what we're going to be talking about is achieving true safety in energy storage, the UL 9540 and 9540A testing. Uh, and as I was very keenly aware, as I was walking around that inner solar show, um, I took the time to look at a lot of our other products in the market. And I was careful to look at the different spec sheets that a lot of these other companies have and noticing whether or not they have ha achieved those 9540 um, listing, UL listings. Because as we're moving into sort of the mainstream of energy storage in this country, a lot of our jurisdictions, a lot of our AHJs, a lot of our building inspectors are going to be looking for these UL listings. And you don't want to, hopefully they won't let you pull the permit in the first place if you don't have the UL listing on some of your products, but you don't want to be waiting there at the very end trying to get the permit signed off just for the inspector to ask for these UL listings and you don't have them. Even if, say, you don't have these UL listings and you, you plan on maybe never getting it inspected, uh, and so you, I don't need to worry about it, Dan, it's, it's going to be important. Maybe you're off-grid. What if it comes to selling the property? Or what if there's an insurance adjuster that comes out for whatever reason? They're going to start looking for these UL listings. So it's really important to understand them, which I'm going to talk about a little bit today, and uh, show the results of what it looks like when we go through these 9540A tests. Um, and I'm going to explain how these two relate. So again, I'm just going to start really quickly and breeze through the, some of the sales stuff. Um, I know if anybody of you uh, has attended some of my trainings in the past, they've already heard some of this stuff, but let's get through it. So Simplify Power, Briggs & Stratton has always been known for safe, proven, and simple technology. Safe as in its cobalt-free chemistry, and that's one of the main reasons or the reason why we were able to have such a successful 9540A fire test. Um, and you're going to see some pictures of that is because it was cobalt-free chemistry. No risk of unmitigated thermal runaway with fire propagation. And I want to pause there for a second because you can still have thermal runaway in a lithium ion, uh, lithium iron phosphate cylindrical cell, right? You can still force it to vent its gas to go into a thermal runaway. But that term unmitigated with fire propagation um, is the key word there, right? So what happens when we force one of our battery cells into thermal runaway? Well, it vents and we were able to achieve some propagation to an adjacent cell, which is required to have a successful 9540A test. But what happened after that, right? And kind of a spoiler alert for this whole talk is that the uh, it's self-extinguished. It didn't go into this unmitigated runaway where it spread from cell to cell within a battery module or spread from battery module to other battery modules or from one battery cabinet to another battery cabinet. So that word unmitigated is really key there. I'm going to talk about the UL1642, which is on the cell level, UL1973, which is on the battery module level, and 9540, which is on the system level. Now, UL9540A, which we're going to get into here in a second, is actually a test. It's not a certification. And what happens in our UL9540A dictates what we kind of call out in our 9540A. And also... UN, Department of Transportation, 38, 3480, and 38.3 are what allows us to airship our batteries and what allows us to ship our batteries in LTL. Again, being that cobalt-free chemistry not only makes the battery safer, but we're able to more sustainably, sustainably source uh, our raw materials that go into these battery cells, uh, mainly being cobalt-free. Proven, we've had a history of making batteries for a long time. As I was walking around that inner solar show, uh, I noticed a lot of people were kind of startups. They'd only been around a little bit. Uh, we have actually have a 10-year warranty battery, on, a 10-year warranty on our batteries. And we've been longer, we've been around longer than 10 years. So we've been able to see some of our batteries that are outliving their warranties in the field today, deployed all around the world. Um, over 250 megawatt hours have installed around the country. We had a great opportunity to work with the uh, Department of Defense early on in our, um, our history of the company, and we were able to um, deploy our batteries in really kind of rugged, uh, you know, vibration intensive, uh, hot forward operating bases. And we were able to prove ourselves and be vetted by the Department of Defense, and we had some great successes there. 
Uh, one thing I don't want to just skip over is we've definitely had a history of a business model that can demonstrate social impact and profitability can coexist. Uh, the kind of triple bottom line, right? People, planet, and profits. And we have deployed uh, our batteries all around the world in many, and we donated a lot of our batteries to be used in clinics, hospitals, uh, schools. So really successful that we're giving back um, to these to these uh, organizations, nonprofit organizations. Simple. So as you look down here in your bottom left corner, these are uh, two batteries that we've been making for a long time. Our Phi 3.8 battery, which is either 24 or 48 volts. Uh, the amplified battery, which is either which is 48 volts only, but it has the closed loop communication capabilities. So that first battery I mentioned it integrates really well. It's a great drop-in lead acid battery replacement. As again, as I was walking around that that show at Intersolar, I noticed so many different inverters that are capable of working with our batteries. Our batteries are inverter agnostic, right? So that battery you see down there can work with your Morning Stars, your Outbacks, your Schneiders, the Victrons, um, the Samlex. You know, you name it. You we got a battery that will work with it as long as you get in and program that piece of equipment to treat our batteries properly, right? Like low battery cutout voltages the floats, the absorb voltages. And what we have uh, online are a lot of integration guides that allow you to uh, look up one of these guides and it will tell you in the order uh, that the equipment is asking for those set points, all the exact set points so that you know you're programming that, that system properly. We also definitely have some larger cabinets that can um, hold these batteries. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit about our new vertically integrated energy storage system. We have our new battery here, which is essentially just like the Amplify battery, but in an outdoor rated cabinet. We have an energy track app, which is really important for homeowners now that everybody expects a little app uh, to watch what's happening with their systems, make adjustments. The installers, you guys are really excited about apps because it allows you to do what? Fleet management remote reconfiguration and push uh, firmware updates. So you're not having to do truck rolls to update firmware. Definitely excited about our inverter. Um, it's a hybrid inverter with built-in charge controllers um, and a, a generator, a extra AC input. So you can either uh, AC couple a generator or come out to an existing site. Maybe you cut a homeowner with some old IQ6s up on the roof. You don't want to get up there and change them to IQ8s. We can come in and AC couple in a storage system. Uh, don't even get on the roof. Don't even touch it. What was really exciting at InterSolar was the excitement around uh, high voltage solutions. And you can see that down here in the corner. Uh, this is containerized solutions, either 10, 20, or 40 foot containers uh, that have rack mounted batteries with a, um, a battery management system up at the top that controls the whole stack. And the reason I believe this was getting so popular was, one, if you walked over to the Solark booth, they had the Solark 30K and the Solark 60K there. These are three-phase commercial systems that need a uh, much higher battery input voltage. Uh, I think the startup voltage, uh, battery input voltage on a Solark 30K is like 150 volts uh, DC. So we don't let you run our batteries in series, um, but we the, the standard Phi and Amplify batteries, but these these battery racks that we provide can be wired in series to series up to the voltages you need. It was a big popular uh, thing at the show. And you don't need a container. Um, when we start to think about larger homes, um, these can be in some sort of a server room or a battery room. Uh, Chuck, do we have any questions so far? We do. We have a question about an upcoming convention. And I have that question fired off to our marketing team. It's asking about BatCon uh, and in Florida in May, and I don't know. I'm going to see if our marketing team can confirm and get back to you there, Matthew. All right, yeah. I'd rather go to uh, Florida in the spring rather than the fall, right, for the, the the hurricanes. And I'm not sure if anybody wants to put it into the chat. I know there's a big storm moving in. I'm up here in Arcata, California, which is in the California north coast up in the Redwoods, and we got a big storm coming in. I know Chuck, who's in the Sierra Nevada foothills, they're expecting some snow. So if you got a, a, the big weather system is going to be impacting you, Go ahead and put it in the chat. Maybe say what your forecasted low is or, or what you expect your snowfall to be. As these storms come along, 
it kind of demonstrates the fragility of our uh, electric grid, which is just kind of reinforcing the, the need for batteries. Simple, again, stores backup power, maximizes re your resilience, and allows you to save money with peak time of use shavings, demand charges. Um, so let's get into it. Why we're here is, is really to talk about safety. Uh, I talked already a little bit about chemistry matters, right? Lithium iron phosphate is the chemistry you, we use. It's the most stable of most of the uh, lithium iron ion uh, chemistries, but also form factor matters. And when you look in one of our batteries, you'll see cylindrical cells. It's the top one here. Cylindrical cells have a metal case around them, which is able to contain thermal runaway events very well. It does have a, a vent at the top, which is able to control that uh, release of gases. They're not pouch. They're not prismatic. Pouch cells, uh, which are the cheapest of all the uh, chemistries, I mean, form factors to construct, uh, tend to be prone to puncture. They can swell and contract. Prismatic cells, they kind of, they're not as, they're not um, anything really that wrong with them but they tend to have much larger cells, individual cells. So when there is a thermal runaway event, what we tend to see is a lot more uh, volumetric uh, volumes of gases released during those um, thermal runaway events. So as we're looking at some of these new, you know, when I hear in the news that there was a lithium ion battery fire, it never really calls out what chemistry was used. It never really calls out what form factor was used. As you kind of see some of these news uh, blurps here, it, it really does a disservice to those people like us who are using cylindrical cells, who are using lithium iron phosphate chemistries, because when you use a cylindrical cell, when you use a lithium iron phosphate cell, it's less energy dense. So you have a bigger form factor. Uh, it's also more expensive, because if you think about having to spool up that cylindrical cell, actually is a more advanced manufacturing process. So what you kind of get is something that's uh, more expensive and kind of not as small of a form factor, but what you really are getting is safety. And, you know, as I'm thinking, you know, 10 years from now down the road, uh, when we're all busy installing batteries and, and there's a battery in our, in our uh, communities, in our neighborhoods, on every other house, what does that look like? Um, for safety profiles, right? You know, we kind of have a battery here and there in our neighborhoods, but really when we start to see these batteries prevalent in, in our businesses, our homes, our houses of worship, uh, what do these look like when they do have these thermal runaway fire events? So I think it's important as we get, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in this uh, industry right now. It's really important that we pause and focus on safety and, and explain and articulate the safety aspects to the homeowners as we're sitting down at the kitchen table with people. Here's the uh, nail puncture test. That's a pretty typical uh, test to kind of demonstrate what happens when you puncture a cell with um, short circuit a cell with a nail puncture test. Um, again, I'm not going to run through all of these, but there's a lot of other examples here where it was a pouch cell with a cobalt-based chemistry. We all start at the UL1642 uh, listing. This is on the cell level, right? So they take one of our battery cells and they subject it to these abusive, uh, regimen of abusive tests, right? Shock, vibration, uh, abnormal charging, force discharged, crush, impact, humidity. And if we're able to maintain that cell's integrity, we go ahead and take the cells and then put them into packs uh, and put these packs into modules, right? The module is the battery itself you could think of. And then we repeat those tests, those same shock, vibration, drop, heating, uh, et cetera, in the battery module level. And if we're able to succeed with that, what we then is have our UL1642 and our UL1973. In order to achieve the 9540, what we do is we take our UL1973 battery modules and then send them off to a UL lab for a test. And it's not a pass-fail test. Essentially, what we do, and I'll show some pictures of this here in the upcoming slides, is we take one of the cells inside of our battery module, wrap it with heating wraps, to, and heat it to the point that it goes into thermal runaway. 
And it also propagates to at least one unheated adjacent cell. After that adjacent cell has gone into thermal runaway, they watch what happens. And in our case, what happened was is that those adjacent cells kind of just petered out. I, I got, again, some graphs. I'm going to show you the temperature rose. The temperature went back down. So we didn't have any um, runaway with fire propagation. I, I remember I mentioned that earlier is that that key word is unmitigated propagation. There was no fire. There was no explosion. So what those tests show us in the 9540A dictate what the 9540A testing uh, standard will be, right? So when we think about, uh, for example, NFPA 855, if you look at NFPA 855, it says, well, you got to have three feet between batteries. You can only have a certain number of kilowatt hours in a certain location. You have to have X, Y, and Z. Well, what we can do is show with a, a 9540A, which dictates our 9540A, 9540UL listing, that we can circumnavigate or um, supersede some of those NFPA 855 rules. Now, you definitely have to consider them because a lot of jurisdictions are going to be looking at that. But if we were shown that we were able to have a safe test at 9540A with our cabinets only 12 inches apart, with only an eight-foot ceiling, only 12 inches away from a, a wall. So we're able to show in the 9540A that we were safe and that dictates what we call out in our 9540 and also what we call out in the instructions that we send, the installation instructions uh, with the batteries. Currently, we you have to have a 1973 uh, battery paired with a 1741 listed uh, inverter. Right now, we have the 9540 listing on our access cabinets and on our BOSS 6 and BOSS 12 cabinets. We're currently in the process of pulling our 9540 uh, UL listing for our new battery. Before I go on, Chuck, are there any questions we got? There are a lot of good ones. I'm trying to get to them as we go. There is one in here. I think it's worth throwing out. Stephen has pointed out that there is a, a Department of Defense code section, I believe he is referencing, that says there is not a battery that we are saying there is essentially a battery that is safer in a significant way over other lithium ion chemistry. So, you know, Stephen, I think a lot of what we're doing in the industry right now is education. And while the, the statement from that code may have been true uh, at, at a point in time, I think the 9540 test results significantly uh, show that there is a safer option out there than, than your run of the mill lithium ion battery. So I appreciate the comment. Um, there may be an opportunity to to educate there as well. Yeah, and that's I think a good point, Chuck. Is education really so? I, if I remember, this is this is almost ten years ago that we had an opportunity to work with the Department of Defense, and at that time, the DoD didn't want to use any lithium ion battery, let alone lithium iron phosphate, because there was this history. Uh, the, those batteries were making the news of being unsafe. So what was the military doing? They're using generators that have a heat signature. They're using lead acid batteries that arrive dead on arrival. So we did some limited testing out at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds where we were took some of these batteries and they, they subjected them to some of these rigorous testings. And really what we did is we educated the DOD uh, to not only say that our batteries are safe, but look, give other people who are making these lithium iron phosphate batteries an opportunity um, it, and then look at those um, without that uh, subjective eye of thinking that it, the, all lithium ion batteries are created the same. You want to keep going, Chuck, or we got another one? Yeah, Stephen provided more information. Um, you know, these are these are some code sections that are obviously important to, you know, that that installation. So it's really important to, to understand your local code or the authority having jurisdiction. That could be the Department of Defense, and they they may, as Stephen said at the top, uh, disagree with what we're stating today, which is that we have a significantly safer chemistry than a lot of the other lithium ion products on the market. And we have the test results to prove that. So I think you know it's a great opportunity to potentially make a uh, a case that there is a safer chemistry uh, commercially available um, than standard lithium ion, and and you know we can uh, we can support however we can in that um, and maybe turn the tide on that code section. 
Yeah, and that's another thing is as I was walking around intersolar, lithium iron phosphate is becoming the standard, really. And, and I see a lot of people that were using cobalt-based chemistries are all moving over to lithium iron phosphate. So it, it's really becoming a common, and, and that's really not what sets us apart anymore is our, our chemistry, because a lot of other people are adopting that. They see the safety in it. What really sets us apart is our form factor, the way we assemble our batteries. We assemble our batteries in Oxnard, California. It's our battery management system that's proprietary to our batteries. It's the way we package them inside a battery module. It's how we integrate breakers. So what's setting us apart really is not is kind of common now. And lithium ion uh, chemistry, I see a lot of them are going over to that lithium iron phosphate. But still, let's take a look at the way people package these things uh, and the form factors and in the larger battery modules. So, uh, sorry to jump, uh, UL9540A developed in 2017 is that methodology to conduct battery cell module unit and system fire tests, right? The system fire test is when it starts to incorporate um, other fire suppression systems like uh, sprinklers or built-in fire extinguishers or deflagration radiuses. And what that does is this test method establishes a risk profile for the battery and the energy storage system itself. And then that's what kind of dictates what our 9540A and the 9540, excuse me, listing is, and also what is called out in our um, instruction manuals. So we all start off at the cell level test. And what we do is we force those cells into thermal runaway, and then we watch what happens. There is not a cell on the market right now that can pass at this level, right? They're so-called unicorn cell. They do go into thermal runaway. Even our cells do that. But then once we do is we package those into a module level. And then I'm not, this is kind of right out of the report here. I'm not going to read it all for you. But what we do is we look at these different uh, criteria as we move to these progressively larger and larger tests. We start out at the cell level test, move down to the module level test, finally down to the unit level test. And that's where we actually stopped because we were able to achieve these criteria, right? There was less than a 97 degree uh, on the target walls behind the, the energy storage system. There was no explosion hazard exhibited by our product. There was no flaming outside the outer dimensions of the battery energy storage system. So we were able to stop here. We did not have to go down to the installation level test, which would have fire protection equipment in, in, um, included. Uh, heat flux, deflagration for flying uh, debris. So really what it did was it showed just how safe these systems can be and then dictated, again, I'm going to keep repeating it, it dictated what the installation instructions are and what the um, inherent safety of the form factor and manufacturing design employed. The installations of these systems are, are becoming, again, more common. A lot of uh, jurisdictions are looking to put these systems outside. They don't even want these units in garages anymore. If you got to put a unit in somebody's garage, what are we talking about? We're talking about parking bollards. We, a lot of times we have to put in, we have to put in a uh, drywall, x rock dry, fireproof drywall behind the systems. So I do see these systems going outside a lot more. But when we do think about putting them indoors, or outdoors, really, we still want to think about the, the safety. And one thing, I'm we're about to look at the, the test results here in a second, but we publish these test results um, online. We make them visible to the public, which um, I would like to see, um, you know, some of those other manufacturers being more upfront and more uh, transparent with their test results, because that's really going to encourage safety within the industry, right? When we go back to the military kind of topic, um, what we wanted to do is Really, it was a big win for the military because once we showed that uh, we have a chemistry that matters, uh, they don't need to keep buying our batteries. There's other people that can come in. I love them for them to keep buying our batteries. But again, it just creates awareness that chemistry matters and form factor matters. This, this test informs system safety characteristics and sets a bar for the performance comparison across manufacturers. So this is what it looked like. This is what the inside of one of our battery looks like um, you can see these are the cylindrical cells here that are all in these little packs that are in series and parallel configurations 
Um, and then what we did is, is a lot of these wires here are actually thermocouples, but some of these wires are powering the heating wraps. So we took two cells, I believe there were uh, um, some of the, the, the heated cells um, were heated, which then caused some of the adjacent cells to propagate. Seven and eight were the unmonitored unheated cells that we were able to get to go into um, thermal runaway. And then what we did is we looked at that and the test results concluded that it did not create that unlimited thermal runaway propagation, that cell to cell or that module to module. There was no flaming, there was no explosion. So again, right now we're on the module level testing. These are right, again, this stuff's right out of our test report that we have published. And what we see here is as we're causing these batteries to go into uh, vent, venting occurred here, thermal runaway occurred here. And the point of this is it kind of drops off right after propagation and we return down to somewhat normal um, temperature ranges, right? Where it still uh, looks like almost 90 degrees centigrade there. The, on the right-hand side, what we're seeing is the volumetric flow rates of gases and the smoke release rates. So if you can kind of see down here, this orange line kind of shows uh, just an inconsequential kind of release of, of uh, gases and of smoke release rates. So what we did is after we did it on the module level, we move up to the unit level testing. So inside that battery module, which is you just saw on the previous side, we took that battery module and put it probably in the worst place you could think of inside a battery cabinet, right? We sandwiched it in between two adjacent batteries and we put it kind of on a lower level shelf. So if this battery were to start flaming, that it would cause these adjacent batteries to uh, propagate and then also potentially cause these upper batteries to propagate as well. So we, we put it down in the lower middle position as illustrated. They put 93 thermocouples. This, this picture, these pictures you see here are right out of the UL labs. Uh, and it was actually kind of side note here. I was really excited as I was um, at the inner solar booth, a lady from UL labs came by the booth and was talking about the testing of these uh, batteries, the, the 9540A. And she mentioned that there is so much demand. So many of uh, our competition of other people in this industry are looking to get this certification that they had to open a whole new lab. And so they're open. I don't remember the state, the, the one that I think we're using is out of uh, Illinois, but they're opening up a new uh, lab just to meet the demand of the number of manufacturers that are sending their battery energy storage systems in to achieve this uh, certificate, this test, which allows them to then dictate what their 9540A uh, certification looks like. Back to the talk. Uh, again, there were thermal uh, thermocouples were placed all over these uh, this system in between batteries uh, on the exteriors of these cabinets. This is this this is the picture of inside of the the UL lab of the testing chamber. If you notice, we chose plywood plywood as our um, walls. Imagine this is your garage, really, if you can think about it. We chose an eight foot ceiling rather than a 12 foot ceiling. And we chose smaller spatial uh, distances. For example, 12 inches between a wall, 12 inches between units, mainly for the rain hoods. And we chose three feet between units for those working clearances. Really, we wanted to pack these batteries, these battery cabinets into the most kind of tight space as possible so that when you, the installer, are out there at somebody's uh, garage or utility room or battery room that you can fit these into a small space um, that we've been able to demonstrate safety in there, um, that they're safely able to, to live in these kind of tight spaces. It's kind of hard to see in the picture, but if you notice that we've actually covered one of these, uh, the initiating cabinet with cheesecloth or uh, UL covered it with cheesecloth. That way the, the cheesecloth being kind of a lightweight material will discolor if any smoke uh, or, or gases are released out of the cabinet and it would discolor showing that release of uh, gases. Uh, 
this is just showing the different thermal couples positioning and all the different thermal couples that were um, kind of in, uh, integrated into this test. And I want you to take note of thermocouple 56. So the uh, thermocouple um, 56 is mounted to the exterior of battery number eight, which is the battery module that we have uh, the initiating heated cells inside of. And in specific to battery num battery module number eight, the heated cells are on the right hand of that battery. So you're going to see thermocouple number 56 is going to show us the highest uh, heat gain of all of these thermocouples. And it's actually not that remarkable how hot it gets. Uh, showing the picture and again of all those different thermocouples that we have that we're measuring. We also put thermocouples on the exterior of the the battery cabinet. These are the results. So really, the results were identical to what happened at the module level test. We had limited propagation to only two adjacent cells. There was no module to module propagation. There was no fire or explosion risk detected. And the highest temperature we saw was 60 degrees. And that was that thermocouple 56, the adjacent battery. Uh, and really what happened is that temperature dropped off rapidly after the test concluded. The back wall, this is the exterior of that boss cabinet, only showed a five degree centigrade rise in temperature, well below the threshold for combustion. Again, we tried to make that test chamber as tight as possible because we realized you as the installers are trying to install these battery systems, these battery cabinets in really kind of tight locations in a garage kind of tucked up against the wing wall. Um, and so what we wanted to do is re uh, reduce that, that height of the ceiling so that we can say in our instructions, right? Because a lot of times an inspector will come out, what's the first thing they do is they're gonna get the instruction manual for whatever, maybe it's a water heater, maybe it's a furnace, uh, maybe it's an energy storage system. They're going to get out your instructions that came from the manufacturer. They're going to go to the clearances page and they're going to look, if anything, to see what are the different clearances and if you've met those. So if you were to open up the instruction manual, uh, installation manual, I should say, for one of our battery energy storage systems, you'll see that, hey, we only need to be 12 inches away. We're able to do this in a room that only has eight foot ceilings. So again, we wanted to make it as tight as possible to make it as flexible as possible. These uh, pictures on the uh, bottom here, this, this chart here is showing, um, actually it's a graph, um, showing the smoke release rate. Uh, and over here are some of the temperature um, rises. This is right out of the, the 9540A test report, which we have published on our website. This is kind of just showing that there was no flames observed uh, no smoke was detected. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this was at the beginning of the test. We, we already saw this picture a little bit earlier. This is what it looks like at the end of the test. Three hours and 43 minutes later, um, it looks the same. There was no discoloration of that um, cheesecloth. The only way we know that there was any sort of test was that we saw those thermocouples um, with a little bit of heat rise. This is what it can look like with a, um, a competition. This is what unmitigated fire can look like. This is what an explosion can look like with a system that's not um, you know, using those safer chemistries, not using those safer form factors. So in this case, you would have to have fire suppression systems. In this case, on the left, you would have to have deflagration radiuses to prevent uh, explosions from damaging things. So you would have to call out much greater spatial distances around your units. So this is the kind of person that would have to go onto that system level test. As we're pulling permits for a lot of our uh, energy storage systems that are, are local jurisdictions, um, I, I believe a good inspector and a, um, an installer have a great relationship and, and they know each other. And when they're coming out to a site, they should already uh, have an idea of the quality of work that that installer should be held to. But a lot of times these inspectors, you know, they're out inspecting all sorts of stuff, um, decks and roofs and water heaters. So 
you know, what we can do as uh, manufacturers is we can publish and go to some of these larger jurisdictions and um, get what are known as um, uh, authorization to mark or memorandum of understanding. Essentially, you send these jurisdictions all your reports, all of these documents, and they will then uh, review them, interpret them, and then give you kind of a one pager saying, hey, if you're coming to this building uh, department and you're pulling a permit on this manufacturer's battery energy storage system, you're good. We've already reviewed it. We don't need to, you know, put it through the ringer and, and make sure you're looking for all these different criteria like um, sprinklers, like, um, you know, drywall. We're, we're clear. It's going to accelerate that permitting process. And as any installer on this uh, talk will know that that works in multiple jurisdictions, everybody Every jurisdiction does interpret things differently. Every jurisdiction calls out things differently than, than the other might. So really creating visibility and creating more understanding across these jurisdictions is really going to make it easier for you, uh, the installer, where you're not having to go back uh, and, and you didn't fail inspection for this or that and having to fix things. Because what we want to do is get that, that permit signed off, get it stamped, get that homeowner uh, their interconnection agreement filed, uh, get them their permission to operate and get them to start participating in uh, energy resilience and being part of the, the solution to demand response. We have 9540 safety, uh, the, the 9540A certified and the 9540A safety test on our access cabinet. If you were to look in this access cabinet, you would see a solar arc up here and you would see six batteries, kind of like what you see here in the Boss 6. You can have an externally mounted inverter, that solar arc, the 12K solar arc could be mounted externally and you could have these Boss 6 or Boss 12. Again- The question that came up on this, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's one I need clarification on myself. So. The anonymous study asks, do we need to pair a UL1741 inverter with a UL1973 battery to get UL9540? Yes. And and I'm so and I don't want to dive too deep in that, but I do want to say this. I don't know how many people on this call are kind of remember the old Wild West where you would have a charge controller from somebody, you would have an inverter from somebody else, you would have a Victron battery management, battery monitoring system. Um, so we didn't really know whether, I mean, you would have to, the, the person selling it to you, the green techs or the Solagents or the alt store would have to make sure that those components are vetted together. Now we know that if you have the 1741 inverter and 1973 battery that they've been vetted to work with each other. And I think I cut you off. What we'll keep going on the, the question. The question goes on and I think you're addressing it there. Can you do a DC only 9540 certification? be paired with any UL1741 inverter or another way of asking that, do they have to go through the 9540A test together, the inverter and the battery through the same test, or can we be putting them together uh, uh, if they haven't been tested together? Well, let me, let me pause on this, is that, so in the 9540A, test, the, the test in which we subject these batteries to a thermal runaway event. There is no inverter, right? There was no inverter in that test room at the UL labs. Um, and, and what we do is, and I'm not sure if this is answering the, the question directly, it's when we have that 9540A battery test is when we can then take that information and then incorporate it into a 9540A certification, right? The 9540 certification isn't a test. And, and I would say the 9540A test, there is no pass or fail. Um, you, you don't pass or fail. It, what you, there can be an inconclusive test, uh, which is when you have uh, a battery cell that's heated to the point where it goes into thermal runaway, but you don't see propagation to an adjacent cell. That would be an invalid test. But when we had a propagation a uh, heated cell, and it did create a propagation to an unheated cell. That was a valid test. And there is no pass or fail. What this uh, 9540A does is it dictates um, what may be necessary to prevent a house from burning down. 
Uh, and that, that's what's called out in the UL 9540. So that's a good question. Uh, if you want to, so whether or not, what I think they're asking is that could you do um, a DC only, right? Can you, can you not use an inverter, right? Just have charge controllers. Um, and I worked at a company called Sunfrost, which made DC fridges. So the idea that you could have DC only loads, um, I, I like that idea. Um, um, it's definitely the old, old off-grid cabin kind of style. But shoot us an email. Everybody's going to see our, our email coming up here in a minute to get their NABSEP credits. And we can uh, elaborate a little bit more out on that. Did I what uh, did I answer that question there, Chuck? Or or yeah, did, did I believe I... so. And okay. <laughs> there's a follow up question that I'm reaching out to our high voltage team on, um, and I'll post that in the chat. All right, thank you. We're 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 finishing up here. We're moving pretty fast. I want to make sure we leave a little bit of time uh, for Q and A here at the end too. If we got any good conversations, um, you know. Again, you guys know this stuff, um, accelerating the energy transition um, where it's the electrification of energy, everything. Um, I saw in the news today too that uh, heat pumps, uh, maybe put into the chat if anybody has a heat pump, right? So let's try and rather than burn natural gas to create heat, let's use electricity that we've generated from our solar panels and maybe stored in our batteries or maybe uh, obtained credits from the grid Let's use heat pumps to move heat from one place to the other. My wife always complained about how uh, heat pumps, when it gets really cold, sometimes they have a little bit of hard time keeping up with the load. And that's when you start to see um, backup electric, uh, electric strip heats kind of will do the backup on that. Um, I definitely uh, have seen heat pump water heaters starting to be leveraged, but apparently uh, heat, pump, heat pumps are, are, the sales of heat pumps have just gone off the charts. So we're seeing this uh, energy transition from using burning fossil fuels to the electrification of everything. Uh, and what we need to do is, is create distributed assets like solar on people's roofs um, and create batteries to create that resilience to keep these systems operating. Um, I, I've seen these systems, and I think the high voltage team is really excited about that, doing stuff um, in front of the meter. But there's a lot of opportunities behind the meter really creating that resilience. You know, a battery, solar is always going to pay itself off, right? Uh, I could, we could use Aurora, we could use open solar, we can model out, uh, okay, you're on this time of use rate from this utility, you're paying this per kilowatt hour, uh, you get this much sun on your this south facing roof, and I can model out, okay, your solar payback is in eight years. Uh, storage really doesn't pencil out with just time of use arbitrage, right? You'd have to have some really insane uh, prices during certain times of the day uh, to justify that. So when you have a, a customer that starts to want to have the conversation of uh, how much money is this battery going to generate for me, you really kind of have to steer that conversation a little bit differently to the effect, well, how much is it worth it to you to not lose your food in your fridge? How much is it to you to not miss a day of work uh, when you're working from home? So definitely energy storage can deliver an economic value, but it's not in the, the ways that we think um, necessarily with just saving time of use arbitrage. Uh, I do see some opportunity, and, and I just was talking to an older gentleman I know um, yesterday who said, he was offered and he accepted this a thousand dollars from the utility and he's accepting a certain amount of money uh for every time the utility grid wants him to discharge his battery to uh do demand response so imagine here in california it's summertime all everyone's elect uh air conditioning is chugging along we actually don't have air conditioning up here in the redwoods but other parts of the state were you know, they're, we're at the peak demand, right? So the uh, Pacific Gas and Electric can then call on our energy storage systems to discharge themselves, covering loads, and you get financially compensated for that. So there is opportunities that are coming along to, to generate economic value with batteries, and it's getting there. But really, um, you know, and we talk about net metering uh, 3.0 in California, which of those of you who aren't in California will know that essentially you're no longer really going to be able to use the grid 
as your battery, right? When you export out to the grid, currently on NEM net metering 2.0, you get retail value. So as the uh, California, Patub California Public Utilities Commission are kind of changing the rules a little bit, if you don't use it, you kind of lose it. So if you don't use it, you store it at your house and then use it later on that in that evening. So the economic value is definitely uh, continuing on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Going back to InterSolar, you know, one of the exciting things in this industry is as I was walking through that booth, uh, through the, um, uh, the show, was there was a lot of battery energy storage systems coming to the market. And what I was realizing is that your average homeowner doesn't recognize many of the brands in that, in that big, huge expo hall. Uh, you and I, energy professionals, energy consultants may recognize a lot of those other brands. But really, when it comes down to when you're sitting down at a kitchen table uh, trying to make the sale with the homeowner, what's going to matter to that homeowner is who's standing behind that product. And I'm really excited to say Briggs & Stratton acquired Simplify Power. And Briggs & Stratton is one of those you know, 114-year-old companies that's been around for a long time. We have a lot of, uh, got a lot of money behind us. So we're really committed to technological innovations. We're really committed to being here for the long run, and we're going to be one of those people that's in it for the long haul. So when we're making those sales, you know, homeowners care about safety. Homeowners care about form factor and our 9540A, and I'm sure you as an installers do too. Um, but really, you know, what really matters to a lot of people also is who is standing behind this product, uh, who has a team to help support your business, drive leads to you. Um, be there for that technical support when it does come is, is really what matters at the end of the day. Um, I will say that um, the, the chemistry matters. And I, I mentioned this before, a lot of people are going to lithium iron phosphate, but also form factor and how we assemble that and where we assemble the batteries also matters. Uh, so with that, Chuck, um, let's jump into any more questions. Uh, let's see what else we have. Yeah, so the chat really took off around uh, 1035 with the introduction of the you know, 19 uh, or 1741 and 1973 conversation. And we've got a lot of follow-up questions on that. I do want to address a follow-up to that original question. I've heard back from our high voltage team. Our high voltage is certified to 9540 safety tested and 9540 on the cell level. So as as one of the things that Daniel was speaking about is a, a lot of these test results are going to determine how the code is informed or how that UL listing is informed. What happens at the cell level matters when you start to put those cells into the components, that cell test informs how that 9540 listing will look. Thank you, Chuck. We've also got a question about the uh, Solar 12, uh, the 5, 8, and the 15. Are all of these going to work under the 9540 certification? Yeah, so currently we only have the, the Solar 12K, and um, but I do see that um, there are more coming down the pipe. Um, I'm really excited about the Solar 15K because it has that 200 amp pass-through. So rather than having to pull loads and do other things, I, so I really hope that that 9540 is coming along for the um, uh, the Solark 15K. Um, but we do, and you can show this to the jurisdictions that we do have the you know the UL 1973 on the the battery modules. Uh, similar question, uh, talking about how we have it on the Solark. What about the Schneider inverter? So yeah, that that's a good point too. So we do actually offer that access cabinet with the Schneider. Uh, I believe it's the XW Pro up top, um, and we'll have to check on that. Uh, so if you want to email us, and we'll get back to you on that. But again, um, for one, understand our access cabinet does have the. Um, you know, I do take that back. We do have it for the the Schneider and for the Solar 12K. Uh, so if you're somebody that likes the Schneider. Uh, go ahead and leverage that and, and you can get that listing. If you actually look carefully at that published 9540 uh, UL on our, our website, 
there's a whole bunch of different nomenclature, a bunch of different combinations of systems that we did have approved. Uh, some follow-up questions about high voltage. Um, you know, our, our high voltage racks aren't outdoor rated, Kenny. So when we're looking at a solution, you'd want to work with our high voltage team to figure out, you know, is there another enclosure for your solution? Um, you know, you'd indicated that a, uh, a cabinet is not, or a container is not going to work in that particular job site. But hey, you know, um, reach out to us. Daniel's typing in the email right now, training at simplifypower.com. We can put you in touch with the high voltage team and they can work out a solution for you. Yeah, sorry, everyone, not to have that um, that up. Training at simplifypower.com. If you're looking for your NAPSEP credits, uh, go ahead and email us. Uh, if anybody's going to St. Louis to the NAPSEP uh, conference, I, I'm really excited to see you there. There's such a great um, uh, organization. I actually met the president of NAPSEP down there at Intersolar. They had a booth there. Anything else? Yeah, Eric asks about the 9540A test results. It says there's a number of clauses with a verdict or result of N, A, P, or C. Do you know what that means, Daniel? No, you know, so a lot of those um, are, again, it's it's not, it's not a, I, I'll have to kind of take a look at what you're seeing there, but a lot of them are not, not applicable um, during certain, some of those tests. Um, and then we'll have to pull out to see what uh, P or C means, pass. I just looked consistent. it up in the document. So like Daniel said, NA is not applicable. Um, P is pass and C is complete. So, you know, the important thing to remember about the 9540A test is that these are essentially hoops to jump through. And so by, you know, um, completing a test part, you are in essence jumping through that hoop where there may be a battery that is unable to complete a certain part of the test due to, you know, maybe a, a, a thermal event, right? That precludes later parts of the test being completed. Yeah, or the absence of a thermal event. Right. Yep. Uh, somebody's if you want asked, more okay. info on that, Eric, give us an email and um, and we can put you in touch with the right people. Uh, somebody's asking, when will you have 9540A uh, test results? Uh, it's in progress. I believe the test has already been completed. We're now using those 9540A uh, test results to then dictate what our, um, our uh, the 9540 itself will look like. Somebody's asking about re battery return. I was excited at Intersolar to talk to a couple companies whose whole uh, company is predicated upon recycling of batteries. And it's already a big industry, right? Think about the number of uh, batteries in cars. That's gonna be huge as we're kind of trying to recycle these batteries. So we don't return the battery to the supplier, um, but I look forward to that industry developing uh, and maturing as we look to go recycling uh, these these batteries in systems um, safely. Uh, if you want uh, to email us, we will send you a link um, to so those test results. Um, yeah, I'll post them. I'll post them right here in a, in response to Eric's question. I, I posted them earlier. Um, if you haven't already seen that link, go ahead and jump into the chat or the Q and A function, and you'll see a, a reply to the most recent question where I provide the ninety five forty uh, unit level test results. Uh, Gary asks, where can I get more info on the safety problems uh, with the chemistry like the Tesla power wall? So, you know, as a as a company that is proud of their safety, we really broadcast it. Um, for a company that might not have such fantastic results, they're a little bit more uh, behind closed doors. So, you know, there's a fair amount of information on the internet. If you just Google, you know, NMC or uh, cobalt lithium battery thermal runaway, there's a lot of really scary videos of puncture tests. Um, I saw one uh, just today about uh, Will Prouse going into a supposedly solid state battery and drilling into it and his backyard, it looked like, and it turned into a gnarly fire. So, you know, there, while a company may not broadcast bad results, there's definitely a lot of information out there. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, any last questions, uh, uh, please, Please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I do see one last, somebody's asking about the estimated recycling costs of a, a lithium 
uh, iron battery, right? You, you were asking specifically for our batteries, but I would argue that it's important to know what is the cost to recycle any lithium iron phosphate battery? Um, and, and it does cost money. And, and I don't know, sure, if you guys have ever bought a, t a new TV recently. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if this is particular to California, but when you buy a TV in California, you actually pay for the recycling, the e-waste uh, recycling of that TV when you buy the TV. So I'd almost like to see that uh, cost to recycle these batteries put up front. I will tell you, this probably you're going to get more uh, valuable materials out of a cobalt-based battery. And I would say if you have a, a lead-acid battery, they'll probably pay you to take it off your hands. So as, as we start to see that um, battery recycling come along, I'm really excited to see uh, how we, we close the loop on these um, minerals and these elements. So we're having to do less mining. Um, so go ahead and uh, email any further questions you guys have. Chuck, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to give uh, give it up here at the top of the hour. Um, again, need NAPSUP credits, go ahead and, and get on board. Thank you again.